Well, good afternoon. It is Sunday, April 2nd, 2023, about 4 p.m. Eastern Daylight. I'm Delaware State Representative Paul Bomback, and it's time for another update on the uh, Delaware Retiree Health Benefits uh, Advisory Subcommittee, on which I serve as a co-vice chair. And I wanted to go over uh, some material that we uh, considered yesterday, uh, last week, and also some material we'll be going over uh, at tomorrow's meeting. Tomorrow's meeting begins at noon. Um, so I don't have anyone on yet, but that's all fine. Uh, this is recorded so people can catch it afterwards. So I'm going to uh, bring up the screen. And uh, so what you have here is uh, if you search on, uh, just Google search on SCBC subcommittees, uh, you'll see the three uh, subcommittees, the current ones, the health policy one, the financial meeting ones, and the, uh, uh, the financial one, and then the retiree health benefits advisory um, subcommittee. And uh, we've had, you can see we've had four meetings in the past, and our fifth meeting is tomorrow. You can look at the agendas, you can look at uh, the recordings from the past, you can look at handouts, and also various public comment. I want to point out that the agenda for tomorrow uh, is, and actually I guess make these a little bigger, it has all the information for joining by Zoom. Uh, please get that meeting's agenda uh, because the Zoom addresses change uh, for, for each meeting. So get the current one. Um, you can, uh, uh, let me see what else. Uh, so you know, we'll be doing the normal stuff, um, approval of the minutes and stuff like that. And then we go to new materials. We'll talk about the uh, the big, the short, the shortfall, we keep talking about that, say a $9 billion shortfall is in something called the OPEB uh, fund, if you will, the other host employment benefits. So that is not what we pay people currently. This is uh, not pensions, but these are other benefits the state pays to past employees, those who have retired. And then we'll have discussion amongst ourselves. We'll have uh, amongst the subcommittee members and then public comment, maybe we'll adjourn. Um, and uh, what else? Uh, we have the, the opportunity to go to executive session. I don't think we expect that right now. Um, but again, it will be from noon to 2 p.m. You can attend in person or you can attend virtually. So that is Monday's meeting. Um, I'm going to uh, jump over to last week's meeting and the handout. Um, I think there's one piece in particular I want to draw your attention to. The 27th, uh, I guess that was last Monday. Um, so uh, you know, some legally stuff that go to this. This slide, I think, was very uh, important to me. Um, you notice uh, it divides states, and some states, I think, are, could be in more than, right, are in more than one column, depending on what they offer, because they can, in some cases, a state may offer one plan to retired teachers and another plan to retirees, state employee retirees who were not teachers. So, for instance, you see Louisiana is in the second and the fourth column. Um, but what you see here is um, the, the terminology we'll use. There's, I'll say, three classes of retiree health benefits. One is that you have what Delaware currently offers. We call it medic fill. Um, I would view it as a Medicare supplement. So um, it, your, your health care costs of retirement go to uh, Medicare, the non-prescription stuff. Well, that's another story. Um, but you know, hospitals and doctors goes to Medicare. They generally pay 80%. And the last 20% is on you. Unless you have a supplement, the state offers this thing called medic fill, and uh, they'll pay a portion, if not all of that, uh, last 20%. And you can see the list there um, has uh, somewhere around I don't know, 15 or so states, maybe 17, that offer the supplement only. And that's what we do currently. Um, if you go to the third column, um, that is this Medicare Advantage plan. And, and these are the states, a few more, so actually, maybe not. Uh, roughly the same number that offer only Medicare Advantage, and that's what the state proposed to do starting this January 1st, but a lawsuit was filed against the state and uh, a, a court, uh, a justice on that thing, Superior Court, ruled that the state could not proceed with that, so instead we are extending the medic fill currently for the end of this calendar year, and the um, State Employee Benefit Committee, the SEBC, plans to vote later this month on whether to extend that extension to go beyond December 31st and go to June 30th of next year. Um, but then on the second column, these are states that offer a choice to retirees and they offer both a supplement like Medicville and also a Medicare Advantage plan. 
Um, so uh, you can see that's used by a few more. And if you combine either the first and the second column or the second and third column, um, you see that depending on how you want to um, sort of lean, if you say states that offer Medicare supplements, well, you add the first two columns, you have well over half of the states do that. And you can also say, what about states that offer both uh, Medicare Advantage, or that offer Medicare Advantage either alone or with others? Again, you get more than half the states. So it depends what you're sort of looking for. But I think uh, the point, I view this as the point is, not a lot of states do what we do and offer only a supplement. And not a lot of states do what was what the SCBC tried to do last year and offer only Medicare Advantage. Um, a choice is more common. Um, and uh, so that, that's a little bit of the landscape. I think that's important to lay out. And then on the right side, a uh, health reimbursement account is offered by just a few states, and in some cases just for a subset of their retirees. Uh, we'll be talking about that a little bit more. So um, with that, I'm going to go through the rest of the slides from last week. Nothing else really jumped out. Lots of fine prints. What are the costs? Um, if you jump, if you look at, yeah, we've got New Jersey here, and I hope you can see this. I'll make it bigger. There we go. So with New Jersey, they have five different uh, Medicare supplement options, four different Medicare Advantage options, and the uh, let me see, the retirees pay somewhere between we'll say four hundred, well between four hundred eighty-seven and six hundred and sixty dollars. I believe that's an. Uh, I believe that that is let me see Medicare Advantage. Um, I wish they would label these better. Um, so I cannot say definitively, but I believe that those are annual amounts. Um, and what you can gen you can say that the Medicare Advantage, the portion that the retiree pays for Medicare Advantage choices, those four different options in New Jersey are are all less than what the retirees pay uh, of their share of the, of the premium or the cost uh, for the Medicare supplements. Um, so, um, it, and I'm not saying that's better or worse, I'm just saying that's the, the numbers are there and that's pretty common. Medicare Advantage is generally a, a less expensive program and one can argue there are reasons for that. Uh, we'll get to that uh, later on. Um, so uh, let's go on to see something else here. These are the costs. Don't need to really belabor that stuff. Um, this, I, I like this slide a lot. So this is how do the different Medicare supplements compare? Um, what do they offer? And for me, was I'm going to go down so you can see the full column is better. Um, I want to look at this left column. Uh, so this is the Delaware plan known as Medic Fill. That's the Group Health Insurance Program. I think that's what GHIP stands for. And the checks mean we offer all these things. And uh, it covers the Part B excess charge, don't ask. Um, and there is no out of pocket, it, it, the out of pocket limit doesn't apply. Then you come over to these right columns and say, which of these columns is closest to Medicville? And what you see is, well, Plan F is. Um, and it has a check everywhere that Medicville has. Um, it has, uh, it, it covers the uh, Part B excess, um, and it has a not applicable for the out of pocket. So you think, boy, that's a really good match. Uh, there's only one problem, which is that you have to have been eligible for Medicare as of January 1st of 2020 uh, in order to be eligible for Medicare F, Medigap F, Medicare Medigap F uh, supplement plan. Um, and so our newer retirees are not eligible for that, and our future retirees are not eligible for that. But the next closest is G, uh, which has a check everywhere except for this Part B deductible. So Part B deductible, sorry, I said do not ask me to go there. My memory is that this is for um, if you get a, a health coverage from somebody who uh, it does not uh, – uh, contract with the, your supplement plan or may not even be a Medicare um, eligible provider, they can charge more. Uh, I think they can charge maybe 15% above the Medicare rate. And uh, that's, and the first $226 of that would be your responsibility if you're under Medicare G. Um, and uh, so that's, and actually also if you're under any Medicare Medigap plan uh, other than C and F. And I think neither of those is available for new retirees. So this 226 a year is what really new retirees are subject to up to that if you are using 
um, providers who are not fully integrated with, with Medicare. Um, but total, we're talking about $20 a month, $226 a year. Um, that's the difference between F and G. That's the only difference that we've seen between F and G. And so if we're looking for a Medigap that matches, that is, um, is truly, truly as close as possible to what our retirees currently have with Medic Phil, um, it would be F if they've, if they're depending on their age or G uh, for all new retirees, those who weren't 65 as of January 1st of 2020. Um, so uh, let's move, but again, keep in mind F and G and F if you're already retired, already 65 and G for anyone new. Um, keep that in mind, That we'll come back to that. Those are the Medigap plans that are closest in benefits and coverage to what we have under Medicville. Um, okay, so uh, I don't want to go through the Medicare, Medicville, yeah, 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 they're all pretty similar. Um, I, gosh, I think we have so belabored Medicare Advantage. Um, the two big differences, prior authorization and network access. Uh, those are issues that are really not uh, present uh, in, in any, to my knowledge, in any real way with all the Medicare, Me Medicare supplement. Uh, all those Medigap plans don't have that, so that's pretty new in there. Um, so uh, the GHIP projection, uh, and so this is so that you know, it, we've got a few things going on, and we've got uh, we've got Venn diagrams. You know, familiar with the Venn diagram, like two circles, and it's sort of like the Olympics, where they overlap in some area and then they don't in others. So GHIP covers the current year costs for anyone with health insurance. So it goes through GHIP, but the what the magnitude that that is expected to be for many years, if you only look at retirees, then that goes into the OPEB. Don't you love these acronyms, GHIP and OPEB? Um, so um, what they did here, let me uh, see what we're doing here. So um, is that in last fiscal year, um, we had a, a bit of a surplus. So we had our revenues at, at uh, let me see, revenues of uh, 1 billion and our expenses at sl uh, slightly less than that. Um, so we, we had a, a $4 billion uh, projected sur or surplus this year projected almost $88 billion uh, uh, deficit, uh, also projected to be less, uh, the def still a deficit, but less partly because we're raising the premiums for current employees. Um, so uh, that'll go less. And again, that, that impact of the premium increases, um, which you see here under the 9.4% rate increase, uh, is changes the projected net income from negative in red to positive in black. Um, so uh, that's, so the SCBC in charge, in charge of all state employee, including retired uh, state employee benefit committee uh, is making changes so that the active employee portion of that uh, is not, uh, is, is covering its costs better going forward. Ah, da, 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 I see anything, G hip, bup, 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 bup. Um, long term healthcare projection, Medicare. Oh, oh, okay, okay, here we go. So, and we saw this also from um, the projections, uh, reports shared uh, by retirees uh, two meetings earlier is that the active employees for next fiscal year starting July 1st of this year, uh, we expected to lose a bit of money for the active employees, expected to lose a bit of money, a little bit more for retirees who aren't 65 yet. And Delaware is a state that once you've put in enough years and you retire, even before you're eligible for Medicare, you're often eligible for Delaware health benefits. And uh, we do not receive enough money to pay the cost of that. So. Uh, next year is expected to lose about $30 million. And then for our Medicare eligible retirees, um, what we bring in is more than what uh, we spend is the projection for 2024. Overall, we have a loss there. Um, okay, so I'm sorry. And they say you should be using this for the underlying GHIP performance, not by population. That's nice. I still like looking at it by population, by actives pre-65 and Medicare. Um, da, 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 percent covered. Um, yeah, I'm not, not going to worry about that one. Um, da, 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 G up here. So again, G is the one that 
I'd like to talk about, we're always, uh, the state's always been looking at maintaining the prescription drug um, benefits and really no change is being considered there that I've heard of. We're really looking at a Medicare supplement or a Medicare Advantage or a health reimbursement account um, as the three main choices in there. Uh, da, 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 da. You can see that with Medicare G, so Medic Phil is here on the left and no out-of-pocket costs um, to the members. Uh, and on Medigap G, no cost except for that $226 a year, less than $20 a month for the deductible if you have a Part B that's uh, for somebody who's not participating. Um, so that's in G, that's zero for F, but F's not available to all new retirees. Um, and then N and, and K um, will have more costs that the retiree um, would be paying. Um, the, uh, the high mark MA is Medicare Advantage. And what you see is zero on uh, these, uh, a lot of these things, but there's out of pocket max of, of one, and that's for uh, travel outside of the US. We have not heard that's a, a big issue. Um, this slide I find really interesting um, as follows. And there's a, you know, I know we're going in a lot of detail and I apologize. I know we're down to only three people on and that's fine. Some people check it later on. But what this shows is that um, there's three different Medigap, Medicare supplement plans graphed out here, G, N, and K. Remember G is the one closest to Medicville. And what you see is that the cost for G um, is uh, pretty uniformly at, or most often much less than what we are paying uh, for, uh, for the medic fill benefit that we provide. Um, so that looks to me like an area for potential savings. Um, it is one where G is uh, assessed, it is priced out to uh, policyholders, those who purchase a plan G policy based on their age. Uh, so you can see the, the you know, cost goes up. Um, while for medic fill, this is really just an estimate of what the overall cost is where our population is. And it draws an estimated uh, line there. Now, obviously, no, no true accurate thing is going to be uh, that, that level, but that's just an, an estimate. But regardless, you can see a lot of space between what we're paying medic fill uh, per employee at different age points than, say, a commercially available medic app, say, a plan G. Um, and you can also see the difference, uh, and these are monthly premiums, uh, is generally $20 or, or more a month, which you may remember is what that one difference of that plan B deductible of, uh, of the $226. So even if you add that $226, um, we're still paying more as a state for Medicville than this graph shows plan G would be costing. Again, I like looking at numbers, we're trying to fill in $9 billion hole. When I see savings, I like to see that. So this graph speaks to me a little bit. Um, this just shows there's a whole bunch of different companies that offer um, a Medicare Advantage, not just the uh, the Highmark one that the state uh, worked with and quoted out. And there's a lot of different choices. Each one has a different set of, plan, set of costs and all, but you can see that the one the state contracted with had zeros across the board, except for the out-of-pocket maximum for travel um, for the, those first uh, five columns compared to the other plans, none of which had zeros all the way across, across those five columns. And then you had uh, differences in prescription coverage and out-of-pocket max. Um, I really don't like spending much time on, on Medicare Advantage. Regardless, let's come down here. So they, um, they provide, it's just the 50, so they provide what the average person based on their history of spending would be paying in a year um, if they had current medic fill versus the Medicare supplement uh, N, G, or K. G is the closest, remember, and then a Medicare Advantage um, plan. And what you see is that retirees be paying between, say, four and seven hundred dollars a year, um, and then the state pays forty nine hundred for medic fill. Um, but on G, on average, uh, the total cost is around thirty two hundred. Um, although all of that's born by the all that's born by the retiree if the retiree is the one who's purchasing the uh, uh, the, the Medigap program on their own and nothing on the state. Um, so and then the Medicare Advantage costs the state uh, costs the retiree less if they're average. So we came back we on the subcommittee said well that's nice average is good but average is going to be better than forty nine percent of people experience so we want some more numbers and we're going to see them. 
Um, so hold on, we'll see them. Um, and that's all that uh, there's a lot of changes coming with Medicare, uh, but nothing that really is a game changer uh, in there. So, you know, uh, some of the spending threshold out of pocket maxes and stuff are, are coming down. Thank you for Inflation Reduction Act. Um, but that's all for that presentation. Brings us to tomorrow's meeting. And I mentioned there's going to be a presentation of material. So let's look at them. So that is follow up on Medicare. I don't think I'll, I'll look at this guy. Okay, so this is tomorrow's, and this is online. This is the meeting materials that I showed you, which is right here. Meeting materials are April 3rd, individual Medicare, marketplace, and medic fill. So that's what this guy is here. Uh, lots of disclaimers and all that kind of junk. Um, so we, we said that A covers inpatient hospital, B covers most of your outpatient stuff, um, D covers drugs, and then you've got Medigap, Medicare supplements. And we talk about a bunch of them, but I always focus on F and G. Um, note that there's two different Fs, and I learned this over the weekend. There is F and there's high deductible F. So when we're talking about F, we're talking about general Medigap F, not general Medigap high deductible F, just to keep things nice and confusing. And as the last bullet knows, F and G are the ones that most closely match uh, the benefits and costs as the uh, special, as Delaware's Medicare program. So uh, this is kind of interesting, this slide here. And what it says is that, because um, we're comparing Medicfill, which the state provides and self funds versus a Medigap program that you, and it points out, we cannot um, contract to have Medi a Medicare supplement G for every retired state employee. Um, rather, we can send our retirees to get a Medigap G on their own. Um, we can also put some dollars to help them buy that. And that would typically be through on the right, a health reimbursement account. So if you go back to that slide and you look here, uh, you look here, um, we could say, you know that 2,400 you have to pay on average? Uh, well, we'll pay you 2,400 and we'll avoid paying $4,900. Um, for um, uh, for what it costs us to do Medicfill for you. We might even say, you know what? We'll put $3,200 a year into that. You can use that for your premiums and for a bunch of your out-of-pocket costs for your prescriptions, uh, any, anything else that's there out-of-pocket. Uh, so you know, we can do that, but we can't do that by providing you with Medigap G, but rather we can give you dollars to get your own Medigap G. And some states do a system very similar to this. So this was an aha, because I always heard about the medic, uh, the, sorry, health reimbursement accounts. And I was always like looking at medic films and that's more expensive than uh, Medicare G. Why don't we just provide Medicare G? We can't do that directly, but we can give dollars to our retirees to get their own Medigap G, Medicare supplement G. And it'd be done typically through a health reimbursement account, like this off, like that. So let's look at some of the more slides for tomorrow. Um, so uh, you know, we can help you uh, uh, with that. So the individual Medicare marketplace, that's if an individual goes and gets their own Medigap program. So we can off, we can help you. And actually the um, office of the uh, state insurance commissioner um, has support for that. I think there may be other folks maybe within DHSS. So there's support for our retirees in shopping for and selecting um, which Medigap, and again, if you want something similar to Medifill, you'd get probably an F or a G, whatever you're eligible for. Um, we can help you with some things. We would presumably set up a health reimbursement account that would help you pay the premiums and to extend any uh, um, out-of-pocket prescription or other uh, medical costs. Um, and we presumably uh, help you get the, the prescription drug. Um, so um, that's how that individual marketplace think. Individual marketplace, you buy it on your own typically with a health reimbursement account that the state puts dollars in every year for you. Um, so too much detail. Uh, the consideration to establish it, you've got the flexibility, you can set up the HRA, um, uh, and you can figure out how big you want it depends. Are you covering all the premium? Are you covering the premium and the expected expenses, et cetera? Um, and is it variable or fixed? This is when I've seen some states who look at it and say, 
we will give you the dollars that you would need to buy um, uh, the Medicare Advantage blank. I'm sorry, gosh, I used the wrong term. Medigap letter, let's say Medigap G for your age. And let's say three different carriers are offering Medigap G in Delaware. Um, the state could say, we're going to put in the premium, the full amount of the premium for the least expensive Medigap G that's available in Delaware. And that's a way that a state can approach it. We have not gotten to that gory level of detail, but that overall concept I think is, is valuable. Um, but then you may also want dollars to, to handle the average out-of-pocket costs uh, so we can figure that stuff also. And uh, will unused funds move forward to the next year? So uh, ignore that stuff. Okay, here we go. Remember I said that they were, they were giving us a 50th percentile. We see we want the healthiest and the least healthy examples also. So. 10%, these are folks who just don't use uh, much in the way of costs. Um, and what you find is, uh, you know, at the lowest 10% of costs, uh, the individual, and in, if you just, let's say you're not a state employee, um, you've got, you know, normal costs uh, would be somewhere around $2,100 a year. If you're under Medicville, you as a retiree would pay somewhere between $200 and $500 a year, and the state would pay about $4,900 uh, for you. So look at that and say, boy, you know, it's a lot cheaper to not have, overall, it's a lot cheaper if the state's not, you know, quote, wasting thousands of dollars on medic fill for these very healthy people. Come down to the average, and we saw this before, average individual paid $2,400 for the Medigap, $800 out of pocket, $3,200 total, which again is much more than under medic fill what the individuals pay for the prescriptions um, that's not covered, and then also at $4,900 a year that the uh, state pays. Okay, well, that's average. Now, what about those who are really not doing well? And by the way, all of those costs are less expensive if you're under Medicare Advantage. So the 10%, way cheaper under Medicare Advantage, just $200 versus $2,000 in Medigap G. Um, average person, $3,200 if Medigap G, say, um, we'll call it $1,200 under Medicare Advantage. Okay, so uh, if you're really healthy, really healthy year, better Medicare Advantage. Average healthy year, better Medicare Advantage. What about really bad here? Love this slide. So this is 90th. So 89% of people have lower costs than this averaged person. Okay. This person under Medigap G is paying about $5,400. Okay. So that's that premium of $3,200. $2,000, they're maxing out their out-of-pocket prescription costs. And then $226, that's that Medi uh, Medicare Part B subsidy, whatever is that that stuff for some out of network stuff. Um, so individuals paying fifty four hundred under currently medic fill, we pay a little bit more than that, but the vast majority is paid by the state, and then the individual pays five to eight hundred dollars a year. Um, but now let's go over to Medicare Advantage, and this we've heard from a lot of people who have been upset about what the state's proposal was: is Medicare Advantage is great. It's much better when you're healthy and not anywhere near as good when you're not healthy. So this individual who has higher costs, higher bills uh, than 90% of uh, examined retirees uh, would be paying thousands of dollars more. Um, well, they'd be paying 10 times as much uh, in this one column, $7,900 versus $797 um, out of pocket. The retiree is paying 10 times as much for Medicare Advantage versus Medicville. And even if you add the retirees' costs and the state costs, which would be somewhere around $5,700, that's still more than $2,000 less than what the retiree would pay for with Medicare Advantage. So you look at this and say, for the average person, Medicare Advantage is less expensive uh, in total cost paid, both retiree and state. Um, and uh, and for the healthiest person, Medicare Advantage is wonderful, absolutely most ex uh, least expensive plan out there. But for those who have um, higher medical needs, indeed, Medicare Advantage is the worst. Um, and it really puts all the burden on the retiree 10 times as much out of their pocket versus uh, our current medic fill. And while medic gap looks like it's $5,400 in the uh, paid by the retiree, if Delaware were to go with a Medigap G solution, we would do that, I understand it, through a health reimbursement account that would throw, throw, sorry, that's terrible, would, would 
would place several thousands of dollars into a health reimbursement account so that the state would be sharing a good portion, maybe even all of that roughly $5,400. And we were already paying $4,900. So let's say we put $4,900 a year into um, the health reimbursement account. The retiree pays the difference $500, which is less than what they're doing on the field today. So um, this would argue that even for the most expensive 10% of people, um, uh, the most expensive, the worst solution for everyone involved would be Medicare Advantage. The second worst, not terribly different, would be Medic Phil. And the best, not by a lot, would be a health reimbursement account plus Medic G. That's how I view these tables, these three tables. And I really appreciate this level of detail being made available to us. This, we asked that subcommittee members asked about this. I think it was, I think it was Mr. Tash or myself both said 50% is great. We want more. They gave us more. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and so anything else in here that matters? We already know, we saw, we saw that before. I We've already seen, so they're, they're gonna be showing the same slides they had before, but we ran out of time. They didn't present them last time. So nothing new in these later slides. I love that slide there. Um, so that was a quick rundown. I'm not getting any questions or comments. Um, so I think it, maybe because it's a nice day outside or people are cleaning up down limbs in their backyard. Um, but uh, with that, I'm going to drop back to my smiling face. And uh, gosh, that was a full half hour looking through those slides. Um, we also have uh, presented uh, various articles on Medicare Advantage. Um, and I frankly, I don't remember if this came uh, from whom, whether it was a member of the public or one of our you know, groups that uh, gives us input um, as a contracting maybe. I don't, I don't know, I don't remember who it's from. Um, but uh, so I'm not gonna go there. Um, oh, I'm not showing it, it's on the screen. Okay, <laughs> Henry, how are you doing? So um, a lot of material will be presented tomorrow. You've seen the sneak peek, it's been available since late Friday afternoon on the state's website of meeting materials for this subcommittee. Um, let me talk about the overall timeline. Senate Bill 29 established the Retirement Health Benefits Advisory Subcommittee and one of its requirements is to uh, produce a report with recommendations to both the governor and the General Assembly by May 1st. That is what we have uh, just four weeks away. Um, we do know that the State, State Employee Benefit Committee plans to uh, consider a, uh, a change to extend the commitment to Medicville for retirees from December 31st of this year to June 30th of next year. If that's the case, then uh, the state budget does not need to have any uh, provision for uh, the cost difference between shifting from Medicville to Medicare Advantage or, or any other change for that matter. Um, it seems likely that the SEBC will adopt that extension, but you know, it's, it's a vote and it's a public meeting, so we'll see how that happens later this month. Um, there's still, even if the plan doesn't change during the next fiscal year, that the budget controls July 1st of this year to June 30th of next year, there will be actions going on in the next 12 months. Specifically, it is very likely that the SEBC will determine what plan or plans they're considering they'd like to see, maybe they're looking for options. Maybe they want to offer medic fill and Medicare Advantage. Maybe they want to offer a health reimbursement account where an individual can buy a Medicare supplement or a Medicare Advantage or whatever the heck they want. Um, it, it remains to be seen what they'll look for, um, but they will be looking because at the very least, they'll be looking to offer a um, a health benefit uh, plan for retirees at the very latest for January 1st of 2025 and possibly as soon as July 1st of 2024. Um, so that requires actions well before June 30th of next year. So I think there still is a role for the advisory committee to issue recommendations by May 1st of this year but they are not as, they don't have direct impact on this upcoming budget um, year, but they do uh, 
have uh, value to the readers, including the legislature and the governor, regarding what our subcommittee feels uh, is uh, the best path or paths to take for future health benefits um, decisions. Now, I do want to, um, I'm sorry, Andrea asked, will the committee still be around? Yes, the, the committee is not, does not, it's not written as sunsetting, it's not written as folding as of a certain point. Uh, we may uh, put in a bill just to officially extend it uh, another year, whatever. I don't, it, it, it's not really extending it when it doesn't have an end, but to just be clear that it's authorized to keep going um, after this, uh, this fiscal year, um, because it was established by this General Assembly in January, uh, I'd say if nothing else, it, it's, it has an implicit uh, life of at least to June 30th of next year, or probably November of next year, which is an election year when the General Assembly, uh, other people you know, are up for election and the General Assembly changes. Um, so I don't think there's a risk of it closing. There is uh, full expectation that the RHBAS will be meeting uh, in June and beyond, I'm sorry, in May and beyond. Um, we don't have any meeting dates set yet, but that is very uh, highly anticipated. Um, and as far as reporting, um, I think that we are um, a subcommittee of the SCBC. Um, and of course, we are also uh, made at the pleasure of the legislature uh, with the signature of the governor. So I would imagine that we will continue to uh, review and share recommendations regarding upcoming decisions by the SCBC regarding um, health benefits and to the extent that we feel it worthwhile offer recommendations to the General Assembly um, regarding uh, any law changes that might be warranted uh, in, in our opinion. So uh, it's still work to be done. The urgency of that May 1st deadline and having that be one and done and everything done there uh, seems to be um, lessened, but that does indeed wait until the S to see if the SEBC indeed later this month uh, extends Medicfil through June 30th of next year. Um, that is what I've got. Um, I'm not seeing further questions. Um, I will say I keep hearing this and I, I lead off and my phrase I often say, people say, you know, what, what do you think the legislature is going to do? And I say, I speak with my colleagues. I don't speak for my colleagues. Um, so I can tell you what I feel and what I can even tell you what I think sometimes. Um, regarding the RHBAS, I serve as a co-vice chair with Senator Townsend under a chair, Lieutenant Governor Bethany Hall Long. Um, and uh, I, but I do not speak for them. I speak for myself. I don't speak for the subcommittee. And um, so that is... Uh, uh, my expectation is that we would not be recommending in this space of my own. I know that I'm not sold on Medicare Advantage only. I'm very much unsold on that. Um, and my read um, of the discussions and the comments from my fellow subcommittee members leads me to believe that it's not, doesn't seem likely if I was a betting person, um, that we'd be recommending a Medicare Advantage only approach. Um, and no guarantees, and that's just my perception. Um, with Senate Bill 29, another thing we did is we added two members to the State Employee Benefit Committee. And um, those, uh, I would, I suspect also would be leery of a repeat and another adoption of Medicare Advantage only uh, proposal. Um, so I think we're going beyond that and whether it be an extension of Medicfil, whether it be an uh, an HRA with uh, Medicare supplements, or whether it be something that offers options um, to retirees um, I, I, that remains to be seen. I also want to point out that that's one piece, you know, that all of those things we've talked about, every single one of those has to do with Medicare age retirees, those 65 and older. Um, I've seen a preliminary slide that indicates that a non-trivial amount of the OPEB, that $9 billion shortfall, does not come from 65-year and older retirees, but comes from the pre-65 retirees. So I would expect, I, I fully expect that we'll be talking about, and I would hope that we would have recommendations that include um, recommended adjustments uh, for the pre-65 retirement age, because 
right now, if I start working at 18 um, and I work for 30 years, and retire at 48, the state's going to be giving me health care benefits from 48 to 65 before Medicare kicks in. And the costs are, you know, they can be fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars $16,000 a year. Um, and I could be working another job at that time or multiple other jobs, and I'm still getting paid by the state. That's not, uh, it's not, it, it's fine if you got plenty of money. The state doesn't. The state has negative money for these um, other post-employment benefits. Um, so that's the thing I think we absolutely need to address. I think there's some things in that pre-retiree uh, arena that uh, we as the advisory subcommittee uh, need to be looking at and saying which of these are more generous than we can afford today and which what's the best way in a fair way uh, to cut them back in some cases maybe with grandfathering so that it only affects those who haven't retired yet etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, so a comment from debbie hras are not acceptable requiring elderly people to go to the marketplace and buy is not realistic we need what was promised um so um, I do understand that, and I, I know that that uh, is an issue that was raised uh, by the, our predecessors, the Retirement Benefits Study Committee, and they were concerned that uh, requiring retirees to choose their uh, Medicare supplement plan uh, is, is a greater burden than it was reasonable. Um, I, I get that. Um, however, uh, we, have, we have the ability, um, and if we did this, the responsibility to make sure that we have great supports for that. Um, and maybe we would end up again, well, I don't, I don't know whether we're allowed to offer an HRA plus other choices, or if you do HRA, it's HRA or nothing. Um, don't know the answer to that at this point. Um, if it's HRA or nothing, uh, then we, I think would actually absolutely have to be beefing up the supports we give for anyone who goes to the marketplace to choose their Medicare. Uh, supplement. I mean, obviously, uh, we have a lot more retirees in our state than 30,000, and they, a uh, good majority of them, I would imagine, go to the marketplace and choose their supplement. Typically, they'll choose one and stick with it year after year. Um, so uh, I think if you think as an employee, for instance, when you uh, get a 401k plan, you choose your investment stuff, you generally aren't doing a lot of changes year to year, just say, keep it, keep it, keep it. Um, and I think that for a lot of retirees, they go in, they look at their conditions, and they say, okay, this is the supplement that works best for me, both cost and coverage, um, and generally are going to stick with it unless a, a notable medical change happens. So this isn't something that really uh, people are often redeciding annually, but are deciding one time. And I think the state is, can rise to the challenge of making sure that we have substantial supports for the year of transition should we go an HRA route. Um, I think the uh, I view the HRA as the way to get medic medic fill benefits um, at a lower cost, and I think we've heard loud and clear that people want to have the medic fill level of benefits. Um, and I'm not saying we're going to do that, but I'm saying if we're doing that, I think we have to be considering uh, uh, an HRA with a Medicare supplement G. That's my own personal view. Um, one of you know a bunch of people on the subcommittee. I'm just sharing my own personal view. Um, and is Medicare that MA profits from? Yeah. Uh, oh, did I miss something? Okay, sorry. Uh, anyway, the state knows that under 65 is costing them, but 65 plus have a golden egg. Medicare Advantage wants that. So Medicare is Medicare that MA profits from. Um, so Henry is uh, raising the, the point that um, the Medicare Advantage, the companies that offer that. Um, uh, are doing that not out of the goodness of their hearts because they, they feel they can um, you know make a, a business from that. They're often sometimes non-profit, sometimes not. Um, but regardless, they looked at, at the situation and say, we can charge it at this point and that will work for us. And um, they viewed it and the way Medicare Advantage is, they take all the costs, they pay it directly rather than have Medicare pay 80%. They only are responsible for the last 20. They get paid by Medicare because Medicare is not paying that first 80%. And uh, they do the math and figure out what well, we can make money, whether it be um, by being really efficient or whether it be by um, using prior authorizations and cutting down on some of the use of the higher expense ones, having them negotiate stuff through being a network and having some savings there. However, they aren't doing it out of the goodness of their heart. They're doing it because they can make it work financially. And that is not, Medicare Advantage is not available for pre-65 retirees. So indeed the state, for whatever reason, I uh, looked at a whole bunch of choices, a whole bunch of different approaches under the, the previous the Retirement Benefit Study Committee, 
And, and it looked initially at several changes for the pre-65 retirees, um, did not, to my knowledge, implement any of those, but those ones I think we as a subcommittee will be revisiting and costing out. I view it as uh, we've got a $9 billion hole. Everything we do, including that 1% of the budget from now on, um, is designed to reduce that, that gap and it brings downward or rather raises our funding level from you know five or ten percent up towards hopefully 80 90 percent um and so I, th I hope that we'll be looking at those elements um, all those elements both the retire the 65 medicare age retirees and the pre-65 retirees and saying well this piece will help our funding ratio by seven percent um and it seems reasonable let's do that this one improves it by two percent it's going to piss people off it's not worth it. So that's what I, I as a subcommittee member, will be looking at is which changes can we make that are reasonable, are um, fair, and have a meaningful impact um, on that funding ratio and getting it up um, up towards that. To me, I want to get to at least 80%. percent i I'd like to say go higher, but uh, and this is not overnight. This is a, if we commit today, we're expecting that within 30 years, we'll be at a funding ratio of 80% or so. And that's um, very desirable, uh, desirable for a whole bunch of reasons, including we don't want to uh, have uh, the state have to put, you know, 10% of its budget uh, in, in in towards retiree health benefits in 20 years, because we have not been saving a long, a long way. Um, definitely look at future retirees and and uh, Debbie absolutely we're we're looking at current employees not because current employees affect OPEB directly but once they retire they affect OPEB so uh, any changes we make between retirement and age 65 uh, any change we make to make that worse is something that affects current employees I'm a current employee um, so we absolutely need to be looking at current employees, um, and we need to look at the current pre-65 retirees, and we need to look at the current 65-plus retirees, the Medicare age ones, and those who will be in those second and third categories over time. And uh, no one's looking at ignoring any of those three groups. Uh, we are uh, generally always tightly looking at those three. Um, so. Uh, we take nothing for granted. We don't make, uh, we, I don't picture us making recommendations of uh, reducing benefits to any of those three populations without uh, having a, a darn good justification for it. But I want to give you a chance to uh, comment back um, if, if you wish to. So, uh, but we are coming up on, a, well, it's more of, I view this always as being a popcorn test. If there's, a, if I'm not getting questions, then I think uh, we're done for the day, but I will get another minute or so. Um, I want to remind you tomorrow at starting at noon is the next meeting of the subcommittee uh, and you'll the page that has all materials also has recordings from past ones. You'll see the same thing. Uh, you have the recording for tomorrow's one uh, once they get it in there. Uh, I want to point out that this is uh, live on Facebook. It'll be saved and viewable on Facebook. And I also save it off and upload it into my YouTube page uh, for those who don't use Facebook. Debbie, let's see. Changes need to be made before retirement, not after retirement. Um, indeed, uh, Debbie, one of the questions we're looking at is grandfathering. And uh, do we say, if you're already retired, we're not gonna change any of the uh, qualifications for, for instance, that health benefits between 48 and 65, in that case of an 18 year old who works 30 years and retires. Um, and uh, so we're, we are absolutely looking at that. Um, and we, well, we are, we're charged with looking at that, and I think we all will. Um, and there's also sort of glide paths to say, well, we can change it if you're, you know, uh, except for those who are within five years. If they've got 25 years in, yeah, we don't want to change it for you. But if you've got five years in, uh, that's fair game. And, and again, not that we would do it lightly, but, uh, you know, it's, I think we're more likely to make no changes if you're already retired and receiving a particular benefit um, or it's imminent than if you're likely 10 plus years out. Um, so, uh, good. And uh, that looks like it. Um, I hope this is helpful. Um, that was, thank you. <laughs> really appreciate it. Um, I want to thank you for tuning in. I want to thank you for 
uh, you, your your passion on this, uh, your commitment uh, to be involved with this and to share your views on this. Certainly, you can also, you know what, I'm going to put this in here, SEVC at Delaware.gov. You can send your comments um, to the following email address. And, um, and as long as you put retirement, health benefits or retirement, something like that, it'll definitely go to the subcommittee and we'll, we get those. Um, so uh, if you, you know, can't tune in, if you're working and you can't make a new meeting uh, from noon to two uh, tomorrow, and but you'd like to be heard, uh, feel free to send an email to that address and that will come to subcommittee members. Um, and, uh, and so there's multiple avenues uh, to reach out. My email is the first comment I posted here, paul.bomback at delaware.gov. Um, I will say, I had somebody email me, actually a friend of mine emailed me, and I didn't respond. They emailed me on Wednesday and on, on Saturdays and emailed to my personal email and said, oh, hey, you're still there? And I said, uh, thank you, I am. Um, especially on a legislative week when we're down in Dover, so I've got the hours driving back and forth and hours and hours going over a whole bunch of different pieces of the legislation. Um, I often do not get to responding to my emails until the weekend. I have no weekends, by the way. I just spend all the weekends responding to emails, preparing for Facebook Lives, you know, doing some other stuff. But I spend a lot of time on the weekends catching up. So send me an email. I will see it. Um, and I will strive to respond to it uh, when I get a chance. Uh, it is very likely that I would not respond until the following weekend when I have more time. Um, so just want to give you a, you know, a heads up on that. With that, I want to uh, thank you for tuning in and uh, look forward to seeing you in the future. I plan to, I think, I think, shoot, I don't even know. Uh, anyway, Easter's next Sunday, so I do not plan to uh, have a broadcast next Sunday. Um, and But I would catch you the week after that on, on the, I think it's the 16th. So uh, with that, please have a good week. Uh, if you celebrate uh, Easter, have a happy Easter season. If you celebrate Passover, happy Passover. If you're in the middle um, of Ramadan, please have a good Ramadan. Uh, we have, uh, uh, and if, regardless, please have a good week. I hope you were safe over the, uh, the storm last night, um, but take care. Have a good rest of your day also.